when I would go to Director Casey or even when General Secord himself talked with Director Casey, the bureaucracy was unwilling to uh, do what uh, was necessary to give him the appropriate security clearances and the like. There was also by this point in time uh, a suggestion by General Secord that he return to the government. And Director Casey, at least as far as he talked to me about it, was enthusiastic about that. And that it was seen by myself, and I'm, I guess by Admiral Poindexter, I assume that that's what it refers to, that that ought to be done. That there ought to be a cleanup, if you will, of the reputation problem that existed from his earlier and uh, abbreviated tenure in the government. Just to make sure, to your understanding, does this reference making things right for Dick in the prof message from Admiral Poindexter have anything to do with money? I don't think so. I'd like you to turn to exhibit uh, 161. It's the next exhibit. And the part I have reference to begins at the very bottom of the first page. Uh, dated 9-17-86, and to get substance, you have to turn to the second page. I don't have a second page, Council. You have exhibit 161? I do. I have a one page. With Top what? part is black. No second page. If you're hampered in answering my question because of the absence of the document, say so and we'll provide it later uh, and we'll return to it. There is a reference in a prof message. This is the one I tried to get Casey's people to pay for as a means of covering some of Dick's debts. Council, I think it's always better to have the document in front of us. We'll return to it. It's 161. We'll simply return to it. Very good. I'd like to turn now to exhibit 164. Do you have that in front of you? I do. That's a prop message of the same date. 17th of September, from you to Admiral Poindexter. I'm looking at one from Admiral Poindexter to me. Look at the one below it. OK, you, I, you I see, see that one? Right. Uh, the first part of it deals with <coughs> Iran. And down towards the bottom of the note, uh, the middle of the bottom section of the note, there's a line that ends with the word CIA, and it reads as follows. CIA could not produce an aircraft on such short notice, so Dick has chartered the aircraft through one of Project Democracy's overseas companies. Why Dick can do something in five minutes that the CIA cannot do in two days is beyond me, but he does. How the hell he is ever going to pay for it is also a matter of concern. But Dick is a good soldier and never even groused about it. Was it your understanding at that time that Mr. Secord's accounts were out of money? Well, let, me, uh, let me first of all try to figure out what we're talking about here. OK, take your time. Okay, I believe that's the transportation of the second channel to the uh, United States. My question is, was it your understanding that his Swiss accounts were out of money at that time? It was my understanding that there was a shortage of funds 
to be used for this activity at that time, or I would not have put that into the record. So that confirms that it uh, and explains why you've testified that you were surprised to learn that there was $8 million remaining. Well, I've taken your word that it's $8 million remaining. I don't know that. What, what I've also testified is that there were four purposes for the funds in what is referred to here as Project Democracy. And it was very clear that, that funds were to be allocated for different purposes. Whether those were in separate boxes in the same bank, I don't know. What is important to understand is I believed at several points that we were low on monies that could be used to support the Nicaraguan resistance, or at this point, that monies were low to support this particular activity. Iran, In second channel. In this particular channel. case, this is Iran. But, but it's also important you understand that it was always the intention to make this a self-sustaining operation and that there always be something there which you could reach out and grab when you needed it. As Director Casey said, you want something you can pull off the shelf and use on a moment's notice. And, and, what I, I'm, and I'm not trying to excuse anybody in this thing, least of all myself. The fact is, he, General Secord, may not have known that, or may not have perceived that he should take funds out of this pot and put them into another one, or that he had allocated certain funds for other purposes and didn't want to touch them. And I'm not, again, I'm, I'm saying that at the point in time when I prepared that, which was on or about the 17th of uh, September. September, that was the information I had at the time. And where did you get that information? Well, I would guess I got it from General Secord. Orally or in some I form of a report? I have absolutely no recollection. But fact, you, I didn't even remember the subject of this profs note until I read the whole thing. You would agree that $8 million would be adequate to uh, charter an air airplane? I would agree, Council. Uh, let's turn to Exhibit 159. May I announce that the vote is now in progress in the House of Representatives. Accordingly, members of the House may have to absent themselves. Please proceed. Do you have that in front of you? I do. That's a uh, prof note also from Admiral Poindexter. It's uh, dated uh, September 13, 1986, which I believe is the same date as the one where he says, uh, keep the pressure on Bill to make things right for Dick. At the bottom of the page, it states, also went over the Sea Chord matters. <coughs> Bill agrees Sea Chord is a patriot. He will check into our suspicions. I told him he could get more detail from you. What is the meaning of the reference, our suspicions? I don't, I'm not absolutely certain about what that is, but I think it's probably what I referred to you earlier as, that there was a lot of internal uh, friction uh, within the bureaucracy about General Secord, that there were people who just didn't like him probably for the same reason that they don't like me. When you get things done in this bureaucracy, you step on toes. And he was certainly a man who got things done. Uh, the, the prof message seems to refer not to other people's suspicions, uses the word our suspicions. Well, was I'm there saying, a... I'm saying our suspicions about why this problem was being created for General Secord, the bad mouthing, as it were. And I think that's what it refers to, although I do not recall the specifics at this point. Admiral Poindexter says that uh, Casey could get more detail from you. Well, I, I knew of people at, the, at his agency who kept bad-mouthing him. And I knew people in, the, in other agencies who said bad things about him and who were uncooperative. Maybe I'm not understanding. What were your suspicions? My suspicions were that that very often we'd have problems, for example, when we were in the midst of one of these transactions of even getting a fixed price on a commodity or enough of the commodity moved around. And you'd inevitably hear, well, you just can't move things here, you just can't move things there. You couldn't get an airplane out of 
these, uh, these folks to move the second channel here to the United States for a secret meeting. And the, just the general lack of cooperation. From whom? From within the bureaucracy. Well, these are suspicions having to do with General Secord, aren't they? No, I'm talking about the suspicions as to why the lack of cooperation is there. Yeah, okay. I, I am not certain at all that this refers to suspicions about General Secord. I'm saying our suspicions as to why people aren't cooperating in getting various things done along the line. I, mean, I think the way that perhaps it looks as though I was suspicious of General Secord. That is not the intent, nor do I think it was Admiral Poindexter's. I mean, after all, the line above, Bill agrees Secord is a patriot. And that's what I, you know, I was saying. This man is a patriot. He's given extraordinary time and energy to supporting our, our foreign policy, to carrying out this initiative, and we can't get people to cooperate on diddly. Did there ever come a time when you entertained suspicions about the way in which money was being used by General Secord? I don't, I, I, I know certainly that uh, these hearings have generated uh, questions and suspicions and things like that. I don't recall a specific time before that 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 was a that I perceived a problem with that necessarily. Did you ever perceive a problem or hear about a problem having to do with the pricing of arms to the Contras? For the, for the Contras? Well, I know we had a big problem with pricing the May shipment, but that was to the uh, Iranians. I'm asked, just to make it clear, I'm asking I you about did you ever hear adverse reports or did you ever entertain suspicions that you weren't getting the stray facts from General Secord about the way he was handling the pricing of arms to the Contras? No, I did hear a report from uh, someone in Central America that General Secord was uh, overcharging on the arms that he delivered to the resistance. and. I sought at that point in time a price list from him and compared those prices to those that others had gotten. Some were higher, some were lower. And uh, I believe at the time I talked to uh, Adolfo Calero about it, who was at that point in time the principal recipient of the arms from General Secord. I don't recall any other other than, you know, this, what you have was a very competitive environment down there. Once the U.S. government withdrew in 1984 from directly supporting the resistance, you ended up with a lot of folks out there running a very cutthroat business. There were two particular transactions or uh, dealers that raised great concerns with Director Casey. Uh, one of them was a transaction of some uh, five to six million dollars from a broker who he was concerned had also been involved in reverse technology transfer to the Eastern Bloc. And he told me to do everything possible to discourage further purchases. The other one was a so-called warehouse operation that was being run in a Central American country that the agency, and, dire and Director Casey in particular, was very concerned about the source of their monies and the fact that this enormous warehouse of several millions of dollars worth of ordnance had been stocked up in that Central American country and the potential adverse consequences. And at one point, he apprised me that he was concerned that that Central American country might have diverted ESF monies, U.S support economic support funds to the military to purchase the arms that went in that warehouse. And so he, does, he told me that there shouldn't be any further transactions with that broker until such time as he resolved or they were able to resolve where those came from. I then talked to Mr. Calero and I talked to General Secord that they should avoid those transactions. My sense is that as a consequence of the advice I got from the director, 
to withdraw from dealing with those two dealers, that a lot of people start putting out very bad word about General Secord. And I think a lot of that was, was brought up here to Washington. I think it was made available to certain members of Congress. And I think that's where a lot of the adverse publicity came from. And the fact is that I was told by Director Casey to, that there should be no further dealings with those two arms brokers. And to my knowledge, General Secord never dealt with them. Ever, if he had up to that point, he certainly didn't do it again. But that a lot of the very negative uh, communications that, that came out about General Secord came out as a consequence of those two guys being cut out of the picture, as it were, in terms of supporting the resistance. Colonel North, did you have any uh, interest, personal interest I'm talking about now, in any of the monies <clears throat> uh, that flowed from the uh, arms sales to Iran or that were kept in uh, uh, Swiss accounts under General Secord's control? Not one penny. There has been testimony, as I'm sure you're aware, that a uh, death benefit account was set up uh, by Mr. Hakim uh, with the name Button uh, for the benefit of your family in the event of your death. Were you aware of any such account? No. Totally unaware of it. First I heard of it was through these hearings. I had never heard of it before, uh, and it was a shock, an absolute shock. There is a, a, a testamentary document which has been introduced in evidence relating to a uh, particular $2 million sub-account set up also by Mr. Hakim. Uh, which uh, provides that uh, in his death, General Secord uh, can control the use of the funds, and in the event of his death, you can control the use of the funds, and it also contains a provision uh, that if everybody dies, it will be distributed to their estates. Were you aware of such a document? No, I never heard of it until these hearings started. I still don't believe it. Uh, I was shocked. and. Uh, I have absolutely no idea where that all came from whatsoever. Never heard of it before. And you never heard of the idea either, I take it? No, ever. I, I, I do want to make one point clear. I did at one point express concern after, I would guess, in uh, February, March, April, somewhere, after I'd met Mr. Akeem, became aware what his role was in the financial network that had been established. I did at some point express concern to General Secord, suppose both you guys go down on the same airplane, flitting back and forth to Europe or wherever you're going. What happens then? And I was told, don't worry about it. Arrangements will be made so that these operations can continue. But nobody ever told me that a single penny was set aside for my purposes, for my benefit whatsoever, ever. And I never heard of buttons or belly buttons until these hearings began. I'd like to separate out then the two issues raised by this will or this testamentary document. You're indicating that the portion of it that provides for the monies being distributed to the estates of the individuals is a foreign notion to you. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, could we please have a copy of the document it's which exhibit 169. Is referring to? 169. term will. Mr. Chairman, I believe the term has been used 50 times in these hearings uh, prior to today. This is not a will, and any lawyer in the room knows it's not a will. It's the first time I've ever seen this document, ever. Understood. You've said that. I just want to separate out the issues. There's a part of the document that provides for uh, distribution to individuals' estates in the event of death. It's on the second page. And I, I take it your testimony is that that concept, not only have you not seen the document, but that concept is foreign to you. You never.
heard of I anything like it. I never heard of it before. I, I don't know how much more clearly I can put it, Council. I never, ever heard that proposal before, that there, suggestion. There's a second part of the document that relates simply to control over the use of the funds, and that's uh, on the first page of it, second paragraph. And I take it that although you never saw the document, the concept that you would control disposition of the funds, I don't mean in your personal capacity, but in your governmental capacity in the event of the death of Hakim and Secord, that's not foreign to you, is it? Well, I, I never professed to have control over a, over a, a single penny of this. I, I elicited the cooperation of General Secord to my knowledge, he cooperated in every case with the things that we asked him to do. But I never once saw those words, nor do I want to leave you with the impression that, that this was what I had in mind when I said to them, what happens if both you guys drop dead? I was more than willing to have anybody else they wanted so that we could continue the activities. But I didn't necessarily wish to become the, the person who had to fly back and forth to Switzerland. I've never even been in a Swiss bank. There's been testimony that uh, several thousand dollars uh, was spent on a fence uh, security system that was uh, put in at your residence, and that the monies to pay for it uh, came from General Secord. Uh, and my question to you is, were you aware, I take it there was a, fan, a, a security system put in at your residence? There is a security system in at my residence. It has since uh, this April been sufficiently supplemented that it is now extraordinary. And I take it, Were you, were you aware that that security system was paid for by General Secord? Well, I'm, I'm going to waffle an answer. I'm going to say yes and no. And if you'd indulge me, I will give you another one of my very straightforward but rather lengthy answers. The issue of the security system was first broached immediately after a threat on my life by Abu Nidal. Abu Nidal is, as I'm sure you on the intelligence committees know, the principal foremost assassin in the world today. He is a brutal murderer. When I was first alerted to that threat by the Federal Bureau of Investigation in late April, I was simply told that there was a threat that had been promulgated by Abu Bakr, who is the press spokesman for the Fatah Revolutionary Council which is the name of the Abu Nidal group. He targeted me for assassination. We then made an effort over the course of several days to have the story killed and not run in US, not me, but the story, killed and not run on the US media. Nonetheless, it ran, and I believe the date was the 28th of April. The initial assessment was that this was a response to the attack on Libya, which we had run a uh, preemptive counter-terrorist raid on Re Libya on the 14th of April, which I had a small role to play. CBS chose to run the film anyway. The FBI was then contacted again and told, asked, <laughs> what protection can be offered? The FBI correctly said, we don't offer protection. I then sought other types of protection. I went to my superiors and said, what can be done? Contrary to what was said some days ago, this lieutenant colonel was not offered at that time any protection by the government of the United States, Senator Rudman. I asked for it, and I was told that the only thing that I could do is to immediately PCS, permanent change of station, you and I as Marines know well what that means, and jerked out of our home and sent to Camp Lejeune, in that I was preparing at the time to go to Tehran, and we didn't want to tell the whole world that, that was deemed not to be an appropriate thing to do. The next thing that we looked at trying to do was to find a secure telephone 
to put in my home to justify the installation of a U.S. government security system. That, too, was impossible or not feasible or couldn't be done. The next thing I did was to ask for a list of who installs these things for, for the U.S. government. Maybe I can get a better price by calling them. I believe it was someone in the Secret Service gave me a list of three or four of these companies that do that kind of installation. I called two or three of them. It is now late April, early May. It's within days of this threat. And I called and I asked, can you come out and do a survey and give me an estimate? And in each case, I think it was two or three of them, and I was at, at that point relatively busy. I was told it'll be several weeks before we can come out and do an estimate and a survey, and it'll be several more weeks or months before we can complete the installation, because after all, summertime is our busy time. At some point along in there, either General Secord raised with me or I raised with him this threat, and I told him I couldn't get U.S. government protection, I couldn't find a contractor to come out and do it myself, and he said, don't worry about that. I've got a good friend or an associate, I don't remember the words, who's an expert. This guy has a company that does these things. And he shortly thereafter, I believe it was around the, the 5th of May, introduced me to Mr. Glenn Robinette. He was introduced to me as a man who, one, had been a former CIA, or perhaps I understood at the time FBI, I don't remember, technical expert, a man who owned a security company, and a man who could immediately go out and do a survey and an estimate. He did. Over the course of the next few days, he went out to my home. I called my wife or told my wife, whatever, that he'd be out. He went through the situation, and he came up with an estimate of $8,500 max. As I recall, it was $8,000 to $8,500. And he could furthermore immediately install the system. Now, I want you to know that I'd be more than willing, and if anybody else is watching overseas, and I'm sure they are, I'll be glad to meet Abu Nidal on equal terms anywhere in the world. OK? There's an even deal for him. But I am not willing to have my wife and my four children meet Abu Nidal or his organization on his terms. And I want you to know what was going through my mind. I was about to leave for Tehran. I had already been told by Director Casey that I should be prepared to take my own life. I had already been told that the government of the United States, on an earlier proposal for a trip, might even disavow the fact that I had gone on the trip on an earlier proposal, and we can come back to that at some time if you like. And so having, been asked, having asked for some type of US government protection for my wife and children, and having been denied that, and perhaps for fully legitimate reasons, and if there is a law that prevents the protection of American government employees and their families from people like Abu Nidal, then gentlemen, please fix it. Because this kid won't be around much longer, as I'm sure you know. But there will be others, if they take activist steps to address the problem of terrorism, who will be threatened. And I would like to just, if I may, just read to you a little bit about Mr. Abu Nidal, just so you know my mental state at the time. Abu Nidal, the radical Palestinian guerrilla leader linked to last Friday's attacks in Rome and Vienna, and that was the so-called Christmas Massacre, in which 19 people died and 200 were wounded, is the world's most wanted terrorist. That's the Christian Science Monitor. When you look at his whole career, Abu Nidal makes the infamous terrorist Carlos look like a Boy Scout. Abu Nidal himself quoted in Der Spiegel, between America and us, there exists a war to the death. In the coming months and years, Americans will be thinking about us. For sheer viciousness, Abu Nidal has few rivals in the underworld of terrorism. Newsweek. Our own State Department, and we have copies of these that we can make available for insertion in the record, but the State Department summary on Abu Nidal, not exactly an overstatement, notes that his followers, who number an estimated 500, have killed as many as 181 persons and wounded more than 200 in two years. Abu Nidal does not deny these things. We also have an exhibit that we can provide for you that shows what Abu Nidal did in 
in the Christmas massacres. One of the people killed in the Christmas massacre, and I do not wish to over-dramatize this, but the Abu Nidal terrorist in Rome who blasted the 11-year-old American Natasha Simpson to her knees, deliberately zeroed in and fired an extra burst at her head, just in case. Gentlemen, I have an 11-year-old daughter. Not perhaps a whole lot different than Natasha Simpson. And so, when Mr. Robinette told me on or about the 10th of May that he could immediately install a security system, I said, please try to keep it to the 8,000 to 8,500. I am, after all, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel, and I live on my salary. And he installed that system. And now let me go to your next question, because I know it's coming and it deserves an answer. I never got a bill. And it is, after all, the answer to your question. It is the answer to your question. I am you asked me where it came from, and I'm trying to tell you. I am going to ask you that question, but... but You've the, already asked me the question. You asked me whether or not the money came from General Secord, and I'm getting there. All right, okay. Okay. When that system was installed, it was practically, it was totally complete. It allowed, for example, that when my wife would trigger an alarm, a, a, an alarm would ring in the central station, and the Fairfax police would immediately be notified. And that arrangement was worked out. This wasn't surreptitious. The Fairfax police came out. You pay your taxes in Fairfax County, but you get your money's worth. And by golly, they came out, and they photographed the house, and they did the normal precautionary things to respond to the kind of terrorist alert that they had been briefed on by the FBI. And that's the best that they could do, and it was at that point, with that security system installed, it was adequate that instantly they would respond to one of those emergency alarms. And Mr. Robinette provided it. Now, I then went on the trip to Tehran. I came back. I never got a bill. I didn't ask for a bill, and I never received one. I never asked, where's the bill, until well after it was too late, and I'll cover that. When I didn't get a bill, I basically understood what had happened. And I don't know exactly how it worked out, but I, I believe that an accommodation was worked between Mr. Robinette and General Secord to make a gift out of that security system that I did not pay for. When I came to the end of my tenure at the NSC, it was to say the least, a busy time. There were other things to be done besides shredding documents when I left. There was a lot of work to be done, and one of the things that I did was to sit and contemplate the previous five and a half years of my work, and I am proud of that work. I believe that we accomplished a lot, but there was one thing that just didn't look right, and that was that for the first time in my life, I had accepted something that I hadn't paid for. And even though I honestly believe that the government of the United States should have paid for it, should have put it in, I then picked up the phone and asked for a bill. I got a bill. In fact, I got two of them. I didn't ask that they be backdated, but after all, Mr. Robinette is an old hand in the CIA. All right. The bills came with the old original dates, and I think there was another bill with a later date on it. And then, as I told you yesterday, I was going to tell you the truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, this is the truth. I did probably the grossest misjudgment that I've made in my life. I then tried to paper over that whole thing by sending two phony documents back to Mr. Robinette. It was not an exercise in good judgment. I don't believe I have any particular monopoly on bad judgment. I think it was a gross error in judgment for this committee to put my home address up on the screen for the whole world to see when I've got 20 security agents guarding my wife, my children, and me right now. I'd also like to point out that it's not quite as bad as it originally seemed. This year, and these things kind of come in April's, I guess. 
But this April, the FBI called again. This April, the FBI called and told me that there was another threat on my life. The big difference was this year, I was back with a band of brothers that has a long reputation for taking care of its own. And the United States Marine Corps and the Naval Intelligence, Naval Investigative Service of Naval Intelligence got together and immediately put security on me and my home where my wife and children are protected. I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. The security system that was installed by Mr. Robinette with General Secord's money, or the Enterprise's money, or Mr. Hakeem's money, or I don't know whose money, was put in and supplemented enormously by the folks, some of which are sitting in this room right now, some of whom are at my home right now, some of whom drive me around in an armored motorcade that makes it look like a, a European potentate. But the fact is, I am grateful for that assistance beyond measure. Because when you think about what could happen when somebody like that is out to kill you and doesn't care if he takes out your children with you, you run out of options in a big hurry. I ran out of options. I think the government of the United States should have stepped up to it and didn't. Whether it's because of laws or regulations, I don't know. I admit to making a serious, serious judgment error in what I then did to paper it over. And I'm willing to sit here and admit to that. But I'm also suggesting to you, gentlemen, that if it was General Secord who paid the bill, whatever it was, I thought it was $8,000, didn't hurt, learn until the hearing started it was more. I also suggest to you that if it was General Secord, first of all, thank you, General Secord. And second of all, you guys ought to write him a check because the government should have done it to begin with. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Colonel North. I need to ask you one other question on this subject. I'll make my second answer shorter. Uh, the uh, documents <clears throat> which I believe you had reference to that, that you wrote uh, and backdated are Exhibits 172 and Exhibit 173. <laughs> yes. Before I get to the document, um, who was it that you made the request for security to and who turned you down? Well, I, I went to, uh, well, first of all, I asked the FBI what they could do about it. And the FBI told me, and I've since checked, and I was since told this again this April when they called about a threat this spring, that the FBI is not in the business of providing protection, and they indeed are not. I'm not, I'm not necessarily, by the way, saying that I think they should have because it is clearly not within their jurisdiction to do so. And it's up to you whether you change that jurisdiction, I suppose. But I, I then asked if there was anything that could be done at the, at the White House. And who, and was it, who was it that you asked at the I White asked House? Admiral Poindexter, and, then, and I was referred to Mr. McDaniel. I was then, it was then suggested that there's only two things that can be done. You can either get a secure phone, we can find a secure telephone and put it in your home and use that to justify the installation of a security system. Well, for whatever reason, no secure telephone could be found. And I'm not, that may well be the case. I don't know. I was also told that the other alternative was immediate PCS to Camp Lejeune or another military installation, and which did not seem entirely practical given that I was getting ready to go to Tehran. Thus, there were no answers. That was Admiral Poindexter or Mr. McDaniel who told you that you could be transferred to Camp Lejeune? I don't recall whether, which one it was. I know that that issue came up and was dismissed. Okay, turning now to uh, <clears throat> exhibits 172 and 173, I take it what you're saying is that they were both typed on the same day. Phone, phone, no, actually, I think they were typed on two different days or maybe even three different days. But they're both phony documents. I mean, I, I've admitted to that. 
I'm here to tell you the truth, even when it, it hurts, okay? They're phony. The second one, Exhibit 173, there are three letters from the typewriter that uh, don't type correctly. How was that arranged? It wasn't arranged. That's the way the, the, the uh, wheel on the thing was when I typed it, and the wheel was defective. It was simply that way. Were the two yeah. letters typed on the same typewriter? No. Were they typed in the same place? No. I, uh, actually, one letter, I think, was typed on one typewriter that was similar to the other one, and I couldn't find a decent uh, ball or the wheel thing that worked right, and that was the only one that was there. And I dummied up even the explanation on the bottom of it. Yeah, well, you say you dummied up the explanation. Uh, That's the way it was. So you didn't drop the ball? No. I mean, after all, how could you, you know, thinking that you were typed, this was not typed at the White House, it was typed after I left. Incidentally, no one else knew about this besides me. I mean, this was my own little stupidity all on my own. And what was the purpose of writing an explanation at the bottom of, the, uh, of Exhibit 173? Well, here, the only, the only letter that you sent with the, a ball that doesn't work, it was a demonstrator model in a store that I typed it on, and you've got to provide some kind of an explanation as to why supposedly a White House typewriter doesn't write. So I explained it on the bottom by saying I dropped the ball. The ball being the explanation for the defective type. Why did you dummy up the explanation? Well, theoretically, I mean, if, we, if you know, I, I object. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Colonel North has frankly admitted what he did here. I, I must believe that the United States Congress has better things to do than focus on two phony letters after the witness has admitted that they're phony. Could we please move on to another subject? We will proceed in the fashion we wish to, Mr. Niels. The fact is, this letter was typed on a machine, but dated as though I was still at the White House. Right? When October 86, I was still at the White House. And the machine didn't work well, didn't write right. Somebody had screwed up the, the uh, wheel on this demonstrator. And thus, I had to explain why a White House typewriter, where they usually work pretty well, didn't work well, and so I put that note at the bottom. It was simply an explanation for why the typewriter didn't work as I had hoped it to. I mean, it's not more sinister than it, than it appears. There's been testimony about uh, use of traveler's checks. I'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, answer or explain that testimony. I take it you have it in mind. I do have it in mind, counsel, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, again, you'll have to indulge me a bit. When I, uh, when I began the covert operation in 1986, excuse me, 1984, uh, in support of the resistance, uh, we had enormous problems trying to, to solve near-time, real-time, uh, what I call operational problems. The end result of that was that I talked to Director Casey about the difficulties. He, step, he had uh, suggested establishing an operational account, and I did so. There were two sources of monies for that operational account. One was traveler's checks from Adolfo Calero, and the other one was cash, eventually, from General Secord. My recollection is that the very first traveler's checks came either very late 84 or certainly early 1985, and that the sum total of traveler's checks was probably in excess of $100,000 or thereabouts. I also had cash, which I estimate today to be somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to $75,000 in cash. So we're talking about an operational account that went from somewhere around one hundred and fifty dollars to $175,000. At various points in time, there would be considerable sums in it, and at various points in time, there would be none in it. My recollection is that I got the traveler's checks in packages of less than $10,000. I understand that others have remembered else, elsewise, but that's how I remember it. 
those funds were used to support the operations that we were conducting. They were used to support the covert operation in Nicaragua, and then eventually were used to support other activities as well. The fact that I had those funds available was known to Mr. McFarlane, to Admiral Poindexter, to Director Casey, and eventually to Admiral Art Moreau over at the Pentagon. It was also came to be known to others, that some of whom you've had testify here. The funds were used initially only to support the Nicaragua program, but eventually it was broadened to include other activities as well. Let me give you some examples. In the Nicaragua program, operational support was provided to a whole host of Nicaraguan resistance leaders, either directly by me from the fund or through couriers that I used to carry it out. Other resistance activities inside Nicaragua were supported of a less military nature in some cases. Europeans who helped us with both the public affairs aspect and the acquisition of other arms through a separate channel outside that you've already heard about from General Secord or General Singlop were paid for out of this account. Money was mailed from this account to addresses in Caracas, San Jose, Tegucigalpa, and San Salvador, among other places, to support activities inside Managua. The Indian movement, the Atlantic Coast Indian movement, was supported from this account, and meetings with the Atlantic Coast Indians, both the Masurasada and the Mosquito movement itself, were supported from this account. And eventually, the fund was used to support other activities, such as a DEA hostage recovery activity and the assistance of another European who we have agreed not to talk about. What's important that you realize is that meticulous records were kept on all of this. I kept a detailed account of every single penny that came into that account and that left that account. All of the transactions were recorded on a ledger that Director Casey gave me for that purpose. Every time I got a travelers, group of traveler's checks in, I would record them, and I would record them when they went out, even going so far as to record the traveler's checks numbers themselves. The ledger for this operational account was given to me by Director Casey and when he told me to do so, I destroyed it because it had within it the details of every single person who had been supported by this fund, the addresses, their names, and placed them at extraordinary risk. Every transaction that you showed on that chart that you had up on the wall or the screen or wherever it was, hard to tell when you see it on a videotape, but when you had it up there, you showed a group of traveler's checks with my name on it. Every single one of those traveler's checks, which bore my name, were used by me to defray an actual operational expense as it happened. I'd cash a check, for example, at Miami Airport and hand the money to a resistance person who I met with there. Or I flew myself off to some place because we were trying to avoid the use of appropriated funds. We used this account to live within Boland and to hide the fact that NSC travel was being conducted. Unlike the CIA, the NSC travel voucher system doesn't have a covert cover. We had one dickens of a time trying to protect my travel. And as you undoubtedly know, gentlemen, I made an enormous amount of travel. The schedule was brutal. Much of it was paid for out of that operational account. There were times when that account was down to zero. No money in it. I didn't have any traveler's checks, and I had handed out all the cash. Not to myself, but to others. Under those circumstances, I would use my own money 
Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North's paycheck money, his own money that he had earned, and I would use it for an operational expense. I would therefore make a notation in the ledger, spent $250 on going to Atlanta to meet with somebody. And the next time I got cash or traveler's checks, I would use those checks to reimburse myself every single penny on the checks that you saw that came to me was used to pay an operational expense on the scene or to reimburse myself. I never took a penny that didn't belong to me. Every single one of those checks, and I would also point out to you, Council, that you don't have them all. Because by my own recognition and memory, there were checks used in 1986, and the ones that you depicted earlier were only 1985. And I used those traveler's checks right up until shortly before I was fired, but only for the purposes that you saw. And I realize that, it, that, it, that this hearing is a difficult thing. Believe me, gentlemen, it isn't as difficult for you as it is for a guy that's got to come up here and tell the truth. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I want to make it very clear that when you put up things like Park Lane hosiery and you all snicker at it, and you know that I've got a beautiful secretary, and the good Lord gave her the gift of beauty, and that people snicker that Ollie North might have been doing a little hanky-panky with his secretary. Ollie North has been loyal to his wife since the day he married her. And the fact is, I went to my best friend, and I asked her, did I ever go to Park Lane Hosiery? And you know what she told me? Of course you did, you old buffoon. You went there to buy leotards for our two little girls. And the reason I wrote the check at Park Lane Hosiery, just like the checks at Giant, is because I was owed my money for what I had spent in pursuing that covert operation. You gentlemen may not agree that we should have been pursuing covert operations at the NSC, but we were. We had an operational account, and we used the money for legitimate purposes within that covert operation. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of more on that subject. When was the ledger destroyed? My recollection is that the ledger, and, I, and I'm anticipating your question, I have tried as best I can to reconstruct not only that, but when a lot of the more intensified destruction began. My sense is er, that it was probably destroyed along about the 4th or the 5th of November. And I say probably because the initial discussions I had with Director Casey about this operation coming unraveled began right after the Hassenfuss shoot down, which was early, early October. I think it was the 4th or the 5th of October. And then the discussions that he had shortly thereafter with Mr. Fermark, who told him that, oh, by the way, a lot of people happen to know that Ali North has been using money from the Iranian arms transactions to support the Contras, or words to that effect. I then went on in a very intensive period of travel, and I must tell you that, that we intensified our efforts considerably. Knowing that this operation was coming apart, we made an extraordinary effort to get the second channel going, to open it up, and to get as many Americans out as we possibly could before it all came down. I believe that it was right after I returned from one of my early November trips, I had a meeting with Director Casey. Director Casey said, look, this, this revelation that's, a, that's either occurring or about to occur is the end. At that point in time, he also told me, you ought to go out and get a lawyer. Now, from one of the guys who's one of the best lawyers in the world by my book, he used to remind me a lot not to say bad things about lawyers. I've been reminded about that since. Director Casey told me to get a lawyer because it was probably going to be a civil suit against me by associates of Mr. Fermark to recover their money. And so in that whole process, somewhere between what I would judge to be the 13th of October and the 4th of November, he told me specifically, get rid of things, get rid of that book, 
because that book has in it the names of everybody, the addresses of everybody. Just get rid of it and clean things up. And I did so. Where did the money come from? The two sources that I remember very vividly were Mr. Calero by traveler's checks, sometimes given, to him, given by him to me directly or couriered to me, and then uh, also cash from General Secord. Did you ever, you, you've indicated that on occasion you advanced your own money and reimbursed yourself out of this fund. Were there occasions when it was the other way around? I don't understand. You borrowed from the fund Never. for personal uh, purposes Never. and then reimbursed. Never. Did you ever uh, permit uh, Fawn Hall to do that? I did. I, uh, as, a, as I recall, it was a very late, uh, probably a Friday or Saturday night, uh, and I had uh, told her that she could take the weekend off, and she didn't have any money and uh, she, needed, she was driving to the beach or somewhere. And I, as I recall, gave her uh, two or three uh, checks, made the appropriate notation in the ledger, and told her that I had to have the money back as soon as she could cash a check. And she did. And I put the money back in the account. That's to my recollection is the only time I ever advanced anybody anything out of the out of the account. I never advanced myself out of there. There has been testimony about efforts to uh, route money to you through your wife um, out of the uh, Swiss bank accounts. Uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to those, that uh, testimony on that subject, if you wish. I'd be glad to. And again, if, if you'll allow me to go back in time a little bit, in February of uh, 1986, we had the first direct meetings with the Iranians in five plus years between U.S. government officials and the Iranians, other than the discussions that were going on in Europe over settlement of accounts. In those meetings, it, in the uh, latter days of February, it was decided that there would be two trips to Tehran, that I would go on an advance trip with General Secord, the purpose of which would be to establish a, an agenda for a higher level trip to be taken by a senior U.S. official. And that trip was planned to take place in April. My advance trip was to have taken place in March. Because the U.S. government had been unable to provide a translator for that session, Mr. Akeem came to that session and acted as translator. And that was, to my recollection, the very first time I had heard of Mr. Akeem. I think it is the first time I had actually met with Mr. Akeem, and I have no recall to the contrary. Mr. Hakim thought that this idea of an advance trip was lunacy. I mean, he, he put it in the strongest possible terms that this was not a good thing to do. The CIA officer who was with me at that, at that meeting agreed with him. When the discussion transpired, it was actually pointed out that you could, you could never be heard from on this, on this trip again. The risks were known to Mr. Akeem very clearly because he is, after all, an Iranian. He fled the revolution that we now seek to get along with. The CIA officer thought that the, that the trip was very high risk. When I later talked to Director Casey, and this was in, within days of this whole event, Director Casey raised another issue, and that was First of all, the trip, you, because it is so black, this advanced trip is so hidden, that we're going to use non-U.S. government assets throughout European or, or Middle Eastern airlines, uh, no U.S. air registration, air flights. You might never be heard from again. The government might disavow the entire thing. And furthermore, I, Bill Casey, am not going to let you go unless 
you are prepared to deal with the issue of torture. But we knew by then that Bill Buckley, well, a man who I knew, was probably dead and that he had been tortured. We knew that he had given as much as a 400-page confession under torture, that we were making every effort to recover. And Director Casey told me that he would not concur in my going on the advance trip unless I took with me the means by which I could take my own life. I did not tell my wife and children that, and they may be hearing it for the first time right now. In the course of that discussion, Mr. Hakeem said to me, if you don't come back, I will do something for your family. He did not say we that I recall. He said I. Now by that point in time, I had come to know that Mr. Hakeem was a wealthy man in his own right. I was grateful for the assistance that he had been providing and translating over several very difficult days of discussions with the Iranians. And several days thereafter, when he suggested that my wife meet with his lawyer in Philadelphia, I agreed that my wife should do so. The purpose, as I understood it, of that meeting was that my wife would be in touch with the person who would, if I didn't return, do something for my family. My wife went to the meeting in Philadelphia several days thereafter. And you have notations in the notebooks that I surrendered to you about what happened. She went, a very brief meeting. There was no money mentioned, no account mentioned, no amount mentioned, no will mentioned, no arrangement. The meeting focused on how many children I had, their ages, and a general description of my family. A brief meeting in the offices, as I remember, of Touche Ross, a respectable firm in Philadelphia, with a lawyer. I then went and, thank God, returned safely from Iran. After that trip, there was one more call to my wife from the lawyer. On or about the 1st of June, almost immediately after my return from Tehran, the lawyer called again and asked for the name of an adult executor for our family in the event, I suppose, that neither my wife nor I were around. I told my wife, do not call him back. It is unnecessary. She never did. She never heard from him again, and she has never made contact with him again. No money was ever transferred to my possession, control, account, or that of my wife, or that of my children. I never, ever heard about belly buttons until these hearings began. Does that answer your question, counsel? <clears throat> yes, and I take it that in answering the question, you've been, you've been uh, telling us what happened at certain meetings that I take it were attended only by your wife. And I take it you're testifying to what you've been told by her. 